Well, good morning and good evening. Uh, in the Zendo here at Twining Vine Zen Center, we have uh, Alex, Griffin, Mavanwi, and myself, Nettie. And on Zoom, we have uh, Sarah in California and Jack in Brisbane, Australia, Pam in Canberra, Australia, and Scott in Monterey, California, and Mark from Pennsylvania. So welcome everyone. A monk said to Zhao Zhou, I have just entered your monastery. Please teach me. Zhao Zhou said, Have you eaten your rice gruel? The monk said, Yes, I have. Zhao Zhou said, Wash your bowl. The monk understood. This is a case from the Mumon Khan, the Gateless Barrier. And all of these lines have a whole ocean of teachings in them for us. A monk came to Zhao Zhou and said, I have just entered your monastery. Please teach me. Zhao Zhou said, Have you eaten your rice gruel? The monk said, Yes, I have. Zhao Zhou said, Wash your bowl. The monk understood. All of these koans and all of the teachings, even though they may appear, particularly to Westerners, to be a little obscure, uh, a little odd, their 100% purpose and intention is to assist us to relieve suffering in the world. That is their total and utter purpose to relieve suffering in the world and to be an expression of that. So this is uh, the Gateless Barriers, uh, Robert Aiken Roshi's commentary, which we use frequently in our uh, Diamond Sangha tradition and is also still used too in the Soto tradition. It's not a primary text there, but it is used in our Soto tradition as well. So this is case seven. And I'll read a little bit of what Robert Aiken comments about this koan. Zhao Zhou is the master of Zen masters. He appears seven times in the 48 cases of the Gateless Barrier and 12 times in the 100 cases of the Blue Cliff Record. Here, here the monk enters Kuan Yin Kuan, Canon Inn, Zhao Zhou's monastery, and presents himself to the teacher. It is a precious opportunity. Young Buddha meets old Buddha, the pattern of all teaching. Our interview practice is a dream of Kuan Yin Kuan. We reenact Zhao Zhou's enactment engagement with his monks in our in, in our encounters. Since each person comes forth differently, the dialogue that makes up this case is unique, special to the student, to Zhao Zhou and to the circumstances. Like our own dialogues, it is a chance to turn the Dharma wheel and change the world. So 
Robert Aitken Roshi here is referring to the dialogues that we have in our Zen tradition, often referred to as Dokusan, and it is a meeting of the teacher and the student face to face, often in a small hut called a hojo, but sometimes in a zendo, and in these contemporary times of COVID, often on Zoom. So it's a meeting of the teacher and the student in a, a very special space. Even when it's done on Zoom, it is a special space. It's a hojo. It is the space where just the teacher and just the student meet face to face, eye to eye, nose to nose. Sometimes a student will meet with the teacher just once. But often it's a time to meet on a regular basis. It can be every month, it can be every two weeks, every week. Uh, in session, in retreat, it's every day, depending on the tradition of that particular Sangha. Sometimes just once during session. Sometimes every day during session, it all, it all depends on how each Sangha and each teacher chooses to do that. But the dialogue that happens in those spaces is the type of conversation that you cannot have in any other situation. It, you, bring to that, you bring to that meeting the types of questions that you're unlikely to bring up at a friend's house, or you're unlikely to bring up with a work colleague. They're the kind of essential questions that are deep and personal to you about life. And you're willing to sort of bear your soul Expose yourself, your inner concerns, your inner musings to the teacher. So this is the dialogue that's happening in this story. The monk has come to this monastery and he says to the teacher, I have just entered your monastery, please teach me. So that's how he opens the conversation with the teacher. How we often do it in our, in our modern day is there's a number of ways that it tends to happen. Sometimes a student is studying koans, in which case they come into the hojo, they bow to the teacher, the teacher bows back, they sit face to face and the student says, I am working on case seven in the Mumon Khan, and they recite the koan that they're working with and then from there the Dharma dialogue begins. Or a student may come to a teacher and bring whatever is happening for them in their practice. And, and it may have a, a sort of a more everyday kind of quality to it of bringing a sincere question like, why am I so restless? You know, I've been sitting for five years and I'm still restless. I still worry and fret. It might be that kind of a question that they bring. And as long as that is a sincere question, it's a very good one. And it's up to the teacher to work with that with the student together for it to be a benefit. Or the student may bring a burning Dharma question, such as, what is the great matter? They might ask the teacher. They might ask that. What is the great matter? And they're asking very sincerely, I'm not sure, I'm asking you. <laughs> <laughs> and 
and then the teacher does what they do, you know, and then they have a dialogue, they have a conversation. And again, depending on the different sanghas, these conversations might be limited to just five or ten minutes, or twenty minutes or half an hour. And there is the occasional teacher that will, you know, maybe spend a, a longer time than that. But generally, it's a fairly succinct dialogue because it's not regular conversation. It's not regular conversation. My burning question for a period of time is how can I know if my practice is true practice? That was a question for me for a period of time that I took to different teachers. How can I know if my practice is true practice? Because I didn't want to be have, I didn't want to have mistaken practice that was maybe doing harm to somebody or was keeping me stuck in a, in a rut of some sort that I didn't know about. You know, I was concerned about blind spots, things I wasn't seeing in my own practice. How can I know if my practice is true practice? And the response that different teachers gave me helped me to relax, basically, helped me to relax <laughs> and trust. To trust that uh, if they had faith in me, then I should have faith in me too. So they're the kinds of conversations that, that you bring to Dr. Sun. So if you who are here today or anyone who hears this talk is a regular practitioner and isn't yet in Dr. Sun, this is an opportunity to think, huh, maybe I, maybe I would like to do that. And then it's your responsibility to go to a teacher and say, is it possible for me to meet with you? If the teacher doesn't go to the student and say, would you like to? Maybe sometimes some teachers do, but mostly the student needs to have a sense of um, intention enough that they will overcome maybe any shyness that they may feel, overcome their shyness to say, could I please meet with you? So that's how the process goes. So that helps maybe set um, a sense of what this particular dialogue is about and how much is embedded in just these small number of words. The monk comes to the teacher and says, I have just entered your temple, please teach me. And this is a beautiful opening for a student to bring. This monk was uh, a mature practitioner and he's saying to the teacher, I've just come here. Please teach me. It's very open-hearted. Please teach me. It's kind of humble. The student humbly says, please teach me. And then the teacher takes up that offer straight away and says, have you eaten your rice gruel? So this is a moment in which the student and the teacher are kind of deciding what kind of conversation is this. The student could interpret the conversation as the teacher just being concerned about his welfare. He's maybe travelled for a number of days from another monastery. He's reached the temple. He's been fed. He's been given water, maybe a chance to, to wash and prepare himself before meeting the teacher. Maybe all of that has happened. And the teacher's asking, just asking that question, have you had your rice gruel? But it's less likely that that's what the teacher would be doing because, as we were just saying, Dokusan is a place where you tend to have different types of conversations that are not um, that are not like the conversations that maybe uh, the head monk might say to you. Oh, have you had have you had your food? Oh, good. I'm so glad. Do you need anything else? What else can I get for you? That would be appropriate for just somebody else. Uh, working at the monastery to say to a new monk that would be a, a, a compassionate and appropriate conversation to have. But here, Jiao Zhou is probably saying, 
have you had your rice gruel? And we're wanting to see what will the monk do with this question? Will the monk understand that this is a question, have you imbibed the teachings of the Buddha? Have you taken in and digested the teachings on no self, emptiness, impermanence, suffering and its cause and the liberation from suffering? Have you imbibed, have you inhaled those teachings? And the monk replies, yes, I have. <laughs> That's how the monk replies, yes, I have. Which is a confident, but also understated. The monk doesn't say, oh yes, I've studied the Diamond Sutra, and the Lankavatara Sutra, and the Samdhinamochana Sutra, and I've memorized this text and that, the monk doesn't say those things or the monk doesn't act kind of too um, overly confident and say something like, why don't you just test me or something, which maybe you could say in some settings, but when you're just meeting an esteemed teacher like Jiao Zhou, you'd want to be very careful about being too uppity, really. So he just says, yes, I have. Jiao Jiao hears that, and then the next instruction is, wash your bowl. And the monk understood. So we have phrases like, wash your bowl, which we can unpack. And I, I will just do a little of that, but before doing that, it's there's phrases that we can just be with them. Wash your bowl. Without analysis. Without looking for the metaphor. Just wash your bowl. When a, circumstances, when a circumstance presents itself to you, respond. When you've eaten your rice gruel, wash your bowl. When somebody walking past you trips, put out your hands to catch them. You don't think about putting out your hands to catch them. You just naturally put out your hands to catch them so that they won't hit the concrete. That's what you do. That's washing your bowl. That's responding from the place of intimacy with all things without forethought about it without thinking, ah, the appropriate response here would be to put out my hands and catch that person falling. You don't do that. You just go, oh, like that. You don't say to yourself, is this person worthy of me catching them and helping them? No, you don't do that. You just put out your hands and help them when they're falling to catch them. You don't think, will I do a good job catching them? Will they appreciate my catching them? Just put out your hands and catch them. So this is wash your bowl. So the instruction for us is in our life, how do we respond appropriately to what is going on? either what's just going on in our personal sphere, what's going on in our community sphere, what's going on globally. We never really know what's going on. But nevertheless, we have to respond appropriately as best as we can. So after, 
after each koan is also a verse. And this is one of my favorite verses. In the Numan Khan, after every koan, there's a verse. And this is one of my favorite. Because it is so very clear, it takes so long to realize. If you just know that flame is fire, you'll find your rice has long been cooked. Because it is so very clear, it takes so long to realize. If you just know that flame is fire, you'll find your rice has long been cooked. Because it is so very clear, is just really referring to our awareness of the present. But our habit of mind of including ourselves in our awareness is so strong that we don't see in a gapless way. We don't, we don't close the gap. We, we create a gap and we fill it with thoughts about things or about ourselves. Like the example, if someone's falling, we just put our hands out. That's a gapless, that's a pure experience. But the minute we think, should I put my hands out? Might I get germs if I put my hands out? Or should I put my hands out? I might feel embarrassed because nobody else is helping. As soon as we do that, we create a gap. That's the gap. So the gap makes it not possible for us to see clearly. Because it is so very clear, because it is so simple, but we complicate it. We complicate it so we can't see with clarity. It's just the rug. <laughs> it's just the watch. It's just the wind. <laughs> we have trouble just doing that. You know, just, just experiencing it directly. Because it is so very clear, it takes so long to realize. We just know that flame is fire, so that just know the pure experience will find our rice has long been cooked, that we were perfect all along, that <laughs> everything was fine all along, all that fussing, it was fine all along. So just some last thoughts about how can we see clearly. Zazen is the, is the main uh, gateway in our tradition for learning to see clearly. Or not learning, having the serendipitous accident prone moment that we suddenly see clearly. Sitting in Zazen, our mind is thinking and our task is to continue to over and over, gently but firmly, bring it back to the present. Usually we sit with our eyes open but cast down in front of us. So for me right now, I can see the edge of the bowing mat and I can see the, um, the rugs that we have in the Zendo here. We have six of them sewn together to create our our flooring and there's a seam. So if, if I was doing Zazen here, my eyes would be cast down at that seam. And my task would be just to keep bringing my mind just simply back to what my eyes are seeing. Without any words, without any thought about it, just over and over. Just bring it back over and over. It's not as if it's like concentrating hard on anything. Just seeing if we can remove or let drift away all of the conceptions of ourself and of the environment and of time and of space. All our conceptions. So it's a strange kind of effort to do nothing but simply be. And it does take effort to just simply be. Because we have such a strong 
habit of bringing thoughts in. So over and over, just simply be. Find the spot that's where your eyes drops down and just keep bringing yourself back to that spot over and over and over, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times. Gently, effortlessly, well, a little bit of effort, but not effortful effort, just a gentle effort. Bring it back, bring it back, bring it back. And just do that without judgment over and over and over. Or if you sit with your eyes closed, the same with sound. Just hear the sound. Hear it. Just hear it. Just hear it. Thinking, thinking, thinking. Just hear it. Just hear it. And if that's our practice and we do that over and over and over, at a moment in time, Suddenly you fully hear it. Suddenly you fully see it. And the gap is closed. So that's our practice. And when the gap is closed, then we function with an easy kind of compassion. It just flows more naturally, an easy kind of compassion. All right, I will stop there and open up for questions or comments. Pam. Nettie. Oh, Mark. Okay, Mark first because can't see you there, so go ahead. And then sorry about that. Um, well, you you probably have an idea of why, but uh, uh, anyway, um, what was I going to ask? Um, oh yeah, uh, you started out uh, by um, talking about um, the uh, interaction between um, the, the teacher and the student. And then you went into the koan, and then you uh, ended by uh, uh, describing the zazen practice. Um, so, um, sorry, I'm having trouble forming this. Um, yeah, uh, did, uh, um, did, did you have anything else in mind? Uh, that they, they you might not have said maybe uh, about, because I, uh, I, I, I guess I don't quite understand where you were going uh, with uh, um, the, the relationship description. Um, the relationship between what I described with Zazen of just being present, is that what you're wondering? how that relates to wash your bowl, maybe? Uh, no, I'm, I'm referring to more, uh, what, I'm referring to how you start started out talk, talking just, just in general about the relationship between teacher and student. Where, where does that fit in? Oh, okay, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one of the things that happens in that relationship, in that time when you're sitting face to face, is it's a little bit like when you're in Zazen trying to bring your mind back to just looking at the spot in front of you or just listening to the sound. When you're with the teacher, whenever, I, whenever I'm in Dokusan myself as the student, when I'm in that relationship, I just want to give all of my attention to that experience so that there is the maximum chance that the words of the teacher will really go in and be with me for the rest of my life. You know, will go in and, and affect me for the rest of my life. And that, that has definitely happened many, many times. I'll ask a question, the teacher usually pauses, and then they say something. And because I'm kind of like looking at them right in the eye, just gently, not too forcefully, just, but I'm there, fully there. Then I hear the words, and they they sound like go in unfiltered. This is this is why the conversation in Dokusan is so different. 
the words can just go right in. And then they go right through into your whole body. It's not always like that, of course. Sometimes Dokusan is a little more relaxed the way it happens. But other times it's very strong that way. Or sometimes the conversation is kind of fairly light and then there's just a particular comment that then is very strong, you know, in the midst of the other conversation. A particular comment is made by the teacher that then goes whoop into the student. Okay, thank you, Mark. Okay, thanks. Pam. Um, I'm interested to, to follow up some of those references to different teachers and concepts you talked about, like Zhao Zhou. Um, so would I be able to Google that um, and to, to find out more about his teachings? And, and how do you spell his name? I've got J-O-W-J-O. -O. I don't think that's it. C-H-A-O hyphen. Right. C H O U. Okay, right. That makes more sense. <laughs> okay. Um, right. Yes. In in this particular collection, they're nearly all Chinese Zen teachers. I think there's one story in there that's Japanese, um, an old folk story. But otherwise, I think they're all Chinese Zen masters. Yes. Mm -hmm. If you Google Jiao Jiao, you will get an awful lot of things. Great. And Robert Aitken for the T? A-I-K-T-E-N. Uh, okay. A-I-T-K-E-N? Aitken? A-I-T-K-E-N. Yeah, okay. Cool. And um, what is the name of the collection again? Uh, probably the English translation is easier to, to write down, The Gateless Barrier. And this is, okay. I mean, you can't see it. I don't know why I'm holding it up. But anyway, this is really probably probably the most famous collection. Um, the, other, the other collections are the Blue Cliff Record and the Book of Serenity would be the other two that are very well known. But this is probably the most well known, The Gateless Barrier. And Robert Aitken was um, the, the head teacher for the Diamond Sangha. He passed away in 2010. And he lived mostly in Hawaii, he was American. And his teachers were Yamada and Yasutani Roshi in Japan. Thanks, Nettie. Yes, yeah, wonderful. I hope you enjoy doing a little bit of reading. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Um, we have time maybe for one last comment or question. Anybody in the Zendo or online? Um, I just want to recommend Robert Aiken's Taking the Path of Zen. Oh, yes. It's very good. Yes. Taking the Path of Zen is a great book by Robert Aiken. Um, it's, it's sort of an introduction to all of the main teachings in the Zen tradition, but also his writing is so beautiful and uh, creative. He's a really creative writer. You can read that book, you know, many times. It's not, it's not a book just for beginners. It's like Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind of Suzuki Roshi's. You can read that book over and over and over. It's quite different to it in its content, but um, it's the same sort of book that's both very beneficial to beginners, beneficial to people partway through their practice, and people with great seniority. It's a beneficial book. Um, we have it in our library. You're in Canberra, right? Um, so we have a, a library here where um, just a few Dharma books. So if you wanted to come here, um, you're welcome to borrow it from us. Um, or, Pam, I could also bring it to you when you and I meet in other situations. So just let me know if you want me to, to bring it for you. Yes? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I will bring it with me today, and next when I meet you, I will give it to you. All right, well, thank you everyone for being here together. Let's finish with the closing verse. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
and of us, I vow to save them. Delusions are inexhaustible, I vow to end them. Dharma gates are boundless, I vow to enter them. Buddha's way is unsurpassable, I vow to become it.